Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you're tuning in. My name is Steve Kozniewski, and this is going to be a live reading from Clickers Forever, the anthology celebrating all things J.F. Gonzalez. This is uh, a, an award-winning anthology. Won the award for the uh, best indie book uh, for Splatterpunk for... 2019, and uh, I'm going to be reading my entry, which is called uh, Deep Into That Dark One Peering, and then afterwards, we're going to be having a little Ask Me Anything, uh, which is sort of a QA. and a um, If you have any questions, comments, or anything like that, go ahead and start putting them in. You can start putting them in now so I can see them, and uh, I'll be answering them after the reading. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously the, the point of this is to help distract folks from the coronavirus outbreak. Um, I personally live in Pennsylvania, and we are one of the states that has been asked to shut down all business, basically, all, all non-life-sustaining business. Uh, which means that I'm working from home, which I'm fortunate to, you know, to have that opportunity. Um, I also, though I own a small business, I'm a co-owner of a balloon shop here in central Pennsylvania, Air Studio. And uh, we have had to shut that down, which is, you know, unfortunate. But we just want to do our part to you know, make sure that the virus doesn't spread and hurt people, that it's not supposed to be hurting. I mean, we don't want it to hurt anyone, but, you know, we all understand that there's a variety of, uh, you know, symptoms. Uh, you know, it especially hurts people with high blood pressure, um, older people, people over 60, and people with compromised immune systems, and that sort of thing. So, unfortunately, we had to shut down the balloon shop, but I have been fortunate to uh, continue working at my day job. And uh, I've noticed that a lot of my peers have been giving away free books, free ebooks, free audiobooks, that sort of thing, which I'm also doing. Um, I will also uh, be mentioning that if I remember. Uh, if you don't know, uh, go to my website, which is Manuscripts Burn dot blogspot.com and uh, right there on the main page uh, you can go to any of the last two blog posts and hear about uh, how I'm giving away a free ebook to anybody who asks to hopefully get you through this tough time because we know that you know social distancing is important and uh, we want to keep doing that <clears throat> so um, in that regards okay I see a little hello from Amy Lauer who is my girlfriend and life partner. Hello, Amy. And, uh, okay, Kenny Hughes is starting to ask questions. Okay, good. So we've got a little something to, uh, to, to get started with. And I see our first question from Kenny Hughes there, who's a good friend and a big fan of uh, Splatterpunk. So let's get started. Um, this is called Deep Into That Dark One Peering. And uh, when uh, Brian Keene, who put this together, obviously in support of J.F. Gonzalez's estate, uh, when J.F. Gonzalez dis, uh, passed away in, I want to say, 2014, he passed away very young, very untimely. And uh, J.F. Gonzalez was most famous for the Clickers books, but he also wrote some incredible, um, he wrote Survivor, which is one of the uh, most important uh, splatterpunk books of our times and uh, a few books like that so this book actually has um, short stories and essays covering all of Gonzalez's work and uh, one of the things that I it just occurred to me even before I wrote it or before I knew it was going to be in the book that the dark ones who are the more um, intelligent villains of the clicker series they're obviously based on uh, the Deep Ones from the Lovecraft mythos. And uh, they're somewhat like, uh, you might picture a uh, uh, an evil mermaid, merman, uh, sort of a scaly 
reptilian creature. And uh, it occurred to me that there hadn't been a whole lot of information about what it's like to be a dark one, what, what it's like to be inside the head of a dark one. And I knew that everyone was going to be doing uh, what they loved with clickers, um, but not, I assumed, not too many people would be doing a story about or from the perspective of a dark one. So this story is about a dark one who was, um, I think we weren't allowed to technically talk about any of the original clickers books, uh, or maybe we knew that they had happened, but that we couldn't be too specific with some of the uh, intellectual property of JF and Brian. So my theory was this is when uh, in the original clickers, some dark one eggs were were captured and what happened to those eggs. So here we go. Deep into that dark one peering by Stephen Kozniewski featured in the clickers for anthology, which is still available. Um, grab yourself a copy. The whole thing's great. Uh, Jonathan Jans, uh, Mayberry, Brian Keane, uh, just look at some of the Gord Rollo, Matt Serafini, Jeff Burke, Wiley Young, my, my co-author, Jay Wilburn, uh, just an amazing table of contents for this. Adam Cesare, Mary San Giovanni, Matt Hayward. Oh. Now, I will tell you this story before we get started. Um, a few years ago when I was at Scares That Cares, which is a, uh, a charity um, convention in uh, Williamsburg, West Williamsburg, Virginia, rather. Uh, and I met Matt Hayward, and he told me about the story he was planning to write for Clickers Forever, and it was instantly enthralling. Just uh, the story from an Irish perspective, and uh, dealing with it's called Bangers and Mash, which is a, a Irish and British uh, food. And he told me about how. Well, not everybody would call them clickers. Some people would probably call them bangers. And he told me that he outlined this whole story, and that's in this anthology. So make sure you pick up a copy um, if you like what you hear, or even if you don't. What the hell? I don't care. Do it, you know, as long as the money gets to JF Gonzalez's estate. Anyway, let's get started. What are you thinking about, Jade? Mold, I croak. My mouth is dry. My skin is, too. Every scale is on fire, brittle, itchy. But I mustn't scratch. Scratching makes it worse. Mold, the shrink repeats back, as if he's never heard the word before. I reach out and wrap my fingers around the glass of water which sits before me. I take a sip and let as many drops dribble down my chin and onto my chest as I dare. It is my only relief from the woolen air. I would douse myself if I could, immerse myself if I had the courage, but I can't. If he even notices I've spilled on myself deliberately, he'll take the water away. There's a colony of mold in my toilet, I say. Sometimes at night, when it's impossible to sleep and my skin is so itchy from the air, I... I shouldn't say this. What's wrong, he prompts. I shouldn't say. Jade... Look at me. I look up from the couch. Kenneth Jensen. That's what the name on the brass plate on his desk reads. He is a loathsome creature, pink and soft. He's naturally scareless, though Jensen lacks even the hair that most humans have on their head and sometimes faces. Even having lived around them my whole life, I can't help but find them repulsive. It's in my nature. You must confide in me. Trust me or the therapy won't work. He's using what he thinks of as his soothing voice, though I can't help thinking of it as his condescending voice. My mouth works a little of its own accord. Father always assures the others that it's just a tick I can't control, an aberration of my aquatic anatomy. I don't know whether he knows the truth. I've certainly never told him, but it's actually a symptom of my constant insatiable hunger. As a mate, Jensen is repulsive beyond all reason. But as a prey animal, it takes everything in me not to walk over, rip his head off, and lap the gushing blood from his jagged throat. What the hell? I'll tell him the truth. How can it make things worse? Sometimes, when I can't stand the dryness anymore, I put my face in the toilet. I'm not allowed a running tap, 
It's my only relief. He nods, his face a mask of sympathy. Go on. I swallow a lump in my throat. There's a colony of mold down there. I can see it, even in the darkness, with perfect clarity. It looks the same day after day. But over time, it does change. Tendrils sprawl out from the center. It moves. It grows. Sometimes I think to myself, this is a city for them. A mold spore may not have consciousness the way you or I do, but maybe on some minuscule level they have civilization. What you're describing is called anthropomorphization. It means attributing human... Well, it means attributing the characteristics of a thinking being to an animal or an inanimate object. I nod. I do. I think of them as little people just going about their days, unaware of some greater intelligence spying down on them. I can wipe them out with the brush of my finger, destroy them, send them swirling away. What would be the flick of a wrist to me would be an apocalypse for them. And why do you think you don't do it? Wipe them out, I mean. I purse my chapped lips, but I'm unable to conjure an answer before the alarm on his desk goes off. Jensen claps his hands together, rises to his feet. Well, that's all the time we have. We'll pick up again from here next week. Is Tuesday still all right for you? I can tell as his face turns a deeper shade of pink that he realizes how ridiculous his question is. I'm not supposed to think of myself as a prisoner. Father's told me so a thousand times. But I'm under no illusion that my schedule, or indeed my life, is my own. Since I don't respond, he hurries to open the door for me. I take his hand as I leave. I've long since learned to suppress my urge to shudder at the grotesque warmth and softness of it. But I expect I'll never get over what is really a gut revulsion. The way some humans hate spiders and leeches is how I feel about humans. I shuffle down the hallway to Father's workspace. I am unaccompanied, a supposed sign of Father's trust in me, but it is not lost on me that all of the surveillance cameras in the hallways of the complex constantly swivel to follow my every move. I am watched ceaselessly. The biometric scanner on the door is incapable of even recognizing my DNA, so I must knock. The door opens and Father stands there, his flat, Useless teeth bared in a smile. I force a smile back at him, though I've been told I look like a great white shark when I do. That's what father expects of me. The prodigal daughter returns, he says, as he does every day. And how are we doing today, my lovely? I'm doing very well, thank you, father. He's only father to me, of course. He has no biological children that I'm aware of. His name tape proclaims him to be Davis. But to the other researchers, he is simply Ron. I guess that would make me Jade Davis, but I've never had occasion to fill out paperwork that required a surname. To the few people I meet in my daily routine, I'm simply Jade to my face, and that horrible thing when they think I'm out of earshot. Good stuff, good stuff, he rattles off mindlessly, rubbing his hands together. Hungry? He gestures at a food tray the service workers have delivered. Only father and myself rate delivery service in the facility, myself for obvious reasons, and father because he's so important. The others, I'm told, must report to the cafeteria three times a day to retrieve their food. Father only attempted that with me once before deciding it wouldn't work out. The tray is laden with a bounty, or at least a human bounty. Grain the texture of wood, floppy dead meat the flavor of plastic, and worst of all, terrestrial vegetables, which I cannot differentiate from my own scat. My stomach roils inside of me, crying out as it constantly does for warm, wriggling flesh. I have forced myself every day for 16 long years to stuff these grotesqueries down my gullet in a vain attempt to dull a constant ache of hunger. I do so now, picking up a fork and knife, as I know Father wants me to, and forcing bite after ashen bite into my mouth. Only the chopped egg and tuna fish are vaguely palatable. The rest is sickening, like filling my belly with sand just to ease the ache. Tell me, Jade, have you ever wondered what we do in this facility? To 
torture me. I've never really given it much thought, Father. He barks gutturally, gasp, clasping his belly. Intellectually, I recognize laughter as the sound of mirth, but it never stops sounding like someone scraping my otoliths with a razor blade. You're a terrible liar, Jade. I wouldn't recommend a career in politics. Try again. Research? What sort of research? My teeth chatter. That involuntary response telling me to rip out father's throat and devour his flesh. Research on sea-dwelling creatures? His eyes glimmer. He's pleased with me, or at least as pleased as he is capable of being. Such as yourself. Such as myself, I agree. Father taps his nose and makes the sound of a bell. Ding, ding, ding. You're so smart. I always said you were. And you're correct. This is an aquatic research facility, and I am a marine biologist. You're my greatest accomplishment, of course, Jade. But now that you're almost an adult, I think it's time you met your brothers and sisters. My eyes widen and my nostrils flare. My interest must be obvious because father is grinning. There are others? Like me? No, not like you. Not exactly. You are a Draco Acerbus, a dark one dark one. I glance at the green scales of my body, a body meant to traverse the inky ocean depths where no sunlight may penetrate, not suffer on land. It seems a fitting moniker, and in all my life no one has ever told me what I am, but now I know. These, however, Father, Davis, I should say, continues, your spiritual brethren are Homaris Tyrannus, Davis places a mason jar on the table between us. It is filled with water, but otherwise seems empty. I kneel down and examine it closely, but then I spot something, a tiny insectoid, no longer than my fingertip. Its skin is yellowish, but mostly translucent. I can see its tiny organs pulsating within. It resembles one of the shrimp the cafeteria sometimes serves. Or, as they're known in the vulgar parlance, clickers. I look up at Fa Davis. I grew from something like this. He shakes his head. God, even for a human, he's ugly. No, my darling, you hatched from an egg. I've kept one of your sisters, actually. Oh, my, you're learning all sorts of things today, aren't you? Yes, I am. He gestures for me to join him at a freezer. He opens the door, and my eyes light on an egg the size of my head, one of my kin. I reach out to caress it, but Davis frowns. He disapproves. Will she ever hatch, I ask? My voice is scratchy whisper, and not just from the lack of order. He chuckles that grating, disgusting guffaw. Oh no, my dear, he says, slamming the door shut. She's hard-boiled. I only, sort of secured permi I only secured permission to keep you. When you survived hatching, I had to dispose of the rest of the clutch, and I could only convince them to keep this one for the testing. I was the cause of this. Me living meant death for my brethren. Did you name her before I trail off? No, not before. But I call her Emerald now. Emerald. The name stirs something in me. If I were like them, salty fluid would be leaking from my eyes. But I'm not like them. Davis picks up a small plastic bag containing a goldfish and walks with it back to the table. He unscrews the clicker's jar, but does not remove the lid. The burbling, mindless fish is small, but still many times the size of the larval clicker. The goldfish could easily swallow it whole. I'm shocked, therefore, when Davis quickly lifts the lid, slips the fish inside the jar. He does it hastily, as though terrified the tiny bug will escape. You feed them to goldfish, I ask? Considering how little regard he had for my biological sister, it makes sense that he would use my spiritual ones as chum. Just watch, he replies. I watch as the dumb fish swims lazily toward the larva. It slips 
constantly flapping. Then the clicker strikes, its tail snapping forward over its head and striking the goldfish's nose. The clicker is so tiny, I'm surprised when the strike arrests the goldfish in its path. The goldfish's face begins to melt, and I suspect the look on my own face is only slightly less shocked than the goldfish's. As its lips and nose sizzle away, the goldfish attempts to escape, paddling full speed toward the wall of the jar. It bumps the wall, and the clicker is upon it. The clicker strikes at its tail, which falls away from the rest of the fish, then strikes again at its body three more times before the flesh, before the flesh drips away from the bone. The entire fish has been liquefied into a putrescent pile which sinks to the bottom of the jar. The clicker begins devouring the vomity mess. I look up at Davis. How am I related to these? That is the question, he replies, for all the world like his beloved Hamlet. Your kind in there shares some kind of symbiotic bond. We've never been entirely certain whether it's that of masters and pets or farmers and stock, but it is my appointed task to learn if either or both of you can be domesticated. Domestication. It's as good a term as any for what he's done to me. But how does one go about domesticating or enslaving or imprisoning a creature like a clicker? Are they intelligent, I ask? Can they be brainwashed, taught to behave as I have? He shakes his head. No more intelligent than a dog, I'm afraid. And we've had to control them as we do dogs. Davis lifts a sheet from a tray of medical instruments. He selects a pair of tongs and a long syringe with a tiny needle. He again unscrews the mason jar, but this time is less careful about removing the lid, as the clicker is still busy gorging itself on liquefied goldfish. With a speed and skill that can only be gained by years of experience, he reaches into the jar with the prongs and immobilizes the clicker. With one hand on the prongs, he uses the other to lower in the syringe and injects something into the clicker. Then, apparently expecting swift retaliation, he removes the instruments and swiftly screws the lid back on. The clicker zooms up the water line and angrily begins punching at the lid. But for now, it can only emboss the metal, not escape. What was that, I ask? That's right. You've never seen a dog before, have you? I don't respond. He continues anyway. A dog will ignore a fence, dig under it or slide through it. But you can put a collar on the dog that shocks it when it crosses an invisible line in your yard. You essentially establish new boundaries for it. No matter how dumb the dog is, it'll stop when it gets shocked. He kneels down and peers into the mason jar. The tiny larval clicker is convulsing, apparently not taking very well to whatever Davis injected it with. What I have inserted into our little friend is a shock collar. The larval stage is the only time when they're soft enough for the insertion. Only one in ten survive the procedure. Only about half of those survive to adulthood. Luckily, I don't have to inject each one individually anymore. We have machines that can do this to an entire clutch of eggs in mere minutes. In other words, he's automated the Holocaust. And now, after 16 years of diligence, my work is paid off. Davis approaches a wall with a small seam in the center. He presses a button and the seam splits, each half of the wall sliding in the opposite direction, revealing a room-sized tank is packed with clickers, ranging in size from a small dog to a large horse. Despite Davis's belittling, I have seen dogs on television, and I know about them. The clickers are not different in form from the larval ones I just saw, but their shells are thicker and harder. I can see why it would be impossible to attempt collaring them at this stage in their development. They seem despondent. They're all sitting on top of each other not even moving or making noise, like zoo animals suffering loss of purpose. And now, my dear, it's time for you to finally do what you were born and raised to. He points at a ladder, leading up into the tank. I've seen what a clicker only a few centimeters long can do. 
These larger creatures could melt and devour me in an instant. I glanced back at Davis, but his eyes have hardened. Some dad. He doesn't even raise a weapon. The cold threat is implicit in his demeanor. I'm not his daughter. I'm just a lab rat. No more vibrant or living than Emerald, my hard-boiled sister. He can have me put down in an instant, like any other animal, if I defy him. What do you want me to do, I ask? Just see if you can communicate with them. That's all. I don't expect miracles today. But this is a process like any other. It'll take as long as it takes. Unless they decide to kill me right now. I climb up the ladder. The hatch will allow me in, but not back out. A safety precaution to prevent the clickers from escaping, no doubt. But also a death sentence for me. I stare down into the glistening sapphire blue liquid. It is calling to me. I want to luxuriate in it. But I have no desire to be clicker chum. I look back to Davis. By the way, he says, I spoke to Dr. Jensen earlier. I wouldn't worry about that mole in your toilet. We're going to have the water cut off. You'll have to shit in the corner, I suppose. The bastard told Davis everything. He probably has been for years. Why not? You can't have doctor-patient confidentiality with a lab rat. Only a person. And I am decidedly not a person. I plunge in. The glorious liquid is everything I've ever dreamt of. My skin feels for the first time like it's not choking me. My lungs don't struggle for every breath. A different organ, one I've never experienced before, kicks in. My gills. I almost don't even care if the clickers kill me. I've never felt so alive. They would only be taking me out in my prime. I sink down to them, but they do not strike at me. In a strange way, I can feel what they feel. They don't consider me food. I drop into the pile with them, gently petting a smaller brown one. They're so miserable. I just want to lay down and be despondent with them. I hug my small brown friend. Inside, Davis is on the telephone. He thinks I can't hear him, but I've never been immersed in water before. He's never measured my full capabilities before. All of my senses are sharpened. In fact, it's like I'm hearing for the first time. Yes, the experiment is going magnificently. Imagine we'll be able to turn their own biological weapons against them. An army of clickers not coming up onto land, but invading their cities, destroying their kind under our control. He's talking about my people, the dark ones. My eyes narrow. I know now what I was born and raised to do, despite what my erstwhile father may think. I approach the glass and bang on it. The clickers are sympathetic to my rage. Brownie and his compatriots approach the glass and begin striking at it with their scorpion-like pincers on their tails. Davis puts down the phone and stares at me. He realizes I can hear him. You can't break that glass. It's shatterproof and three feet thick. <clears throat> break it? No, I don't mean to break it. I pinch my eyes shut and concentrate. Spray. I will them as though willing my own limbs to spray. The clickers raise their tails and coat the glass in venom. It begins to melt. Panicking, Davis raises his hand, a remote control in it. The clickers begin to quiver in pain, their electric collars activated. But it's too late. The plate glass has already melted most of the way through. I fly at the wall, my body instantly knowing how to swim at speeds I've never imagined. The tiny vestigial layer of glass explodes outwards, and in an instant, I'm on him. I wrench the remote out of his hands. The rest of his arm comes with it, and blood begins spurting from the stump. Screaming, Davis drops to his knees. The clickers form a phalanx behind me, eagerly clicking their desire for a proper living meal, but I don't let them attack. No, wait. There are plenty of people in this facility for them to enjoy, 
not least of all that treacherous Jensen. As for Davis, I want to devour him myself. Alarms are blaring. They must have started when I shattered the glass. Security personnel pour into the room, weapons raised. The clickers need no direction from me. Brownie blinds the first one through the door with a spritz of venom. Shrieks of horror mingle with impotent gunfire. Faces melt away and flesh sloughs from bone as the men are reduced to the level of the goldfish. The clickers have rediscovered their purpose. I kneel down before the panicking, shock-addled humans who thought that he could control me. I take his face in my hands. He looks up at me. Thank you for helping me discover what I really am. I lean forward to kiss his forehead. My mouth comes away bloody and dripping with delicious, still pulsating brains. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Deep Into That Dark One Peering from Clickers Forever, a tribute to J.F. Gonzalez, and available now on Amazon and all of your favorite book buying sites. So it's about 2.30 now, and uh, for the rest of the hour, or as long as folks are interested, uh, I'm open to uh, ask me anything or a Q&A session. So let's see what's been going on. Ooh, actually, we might have a few questions on here already. So, all right. First question comes from Kenny Hughes, who asks, what's your favorite Sisters of Slaughter album? So what Kenny is talking about is my shirt here, which is the Sisters of Slaughter uh, t-shirt. And uh, this is a joke or a story that I sometimes tell. The Sisters of Slaughter, oh, pardon me, better have some coffee. Uh, so the joke is that the Sisters of Slaughter are not a metal band, obviously. They are a writing team. Uh, Michelle Garza and Melissa Laysan out of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, actually. Hey, girls, if you're uh, watching. Um, so they're, they are a great um, writing team who I actually wrote with uh, in sort of a writer's room scenario, which we can talk about if anybody's interested. Um, but yeah, I, I've worked with them a bit, met them. They're very nice and uh, great writers. I just finished uh, Kingdom of Teeth, which is their, well, I don't want to say first, but maybe first, uh, attempt at bizarro writing. And uh, of course, they well, they love metal, they're big metal heads, and they wanted a metal type t shirt for their writing team, you know, a swag as we all have. Like, for instance, uh, here's uh, Grindhouse Press bookmark, um, buttons, uh, you know, I have some eraser head press buttons, uh, stickers. It's all Grindhouse, is what I seem to have. Closest to me, but go ahead, go, go to Grindhouse and, and buy their books. Anyway, um, publishers and writers have swag just like that. And uh, I often wear my Sisters of Slaughter t shirt to conventions, which uh, the unofficial, um, uh, what do you call it? The unofficial uh, dress code for conventions, for horror conventions, is a black t shirt and jeans. So I often end up wearing my Sisters of Slaughter t-shirt at conventions. And it was kind of funny because on numerous occasions, like not just once, but on numerous occasions, I've had people come up to me and say, oh, the Sisters of Slaughter, I saw them in York, Pennsylvania in 1987. They were great, man. They opened for Metallica. And I'm like, all right, yeah, cool, yeah. Because I don't, I don't listen to metal myself. So um, it's just a funny little story that, people will kind of convince themselves if they see a metal looking t-shirt that that's an actual metal band when it's, you know, they're, they're horror authors. So Kenny asks, what's your favorite Sisters of Slaughter album? Um, my, my and blue, man. Okay. Uh, my stepmother, Terry says we're watching. Thank you. Say hello to your dad. We are so proud of you. Hi dad. Thank you. Okay. 
Betty Rock Study joined. Wiley Young joined. I don't know who any of these people are. No, I'm just I'm just joshing you. Of course, I know Sean Hop, Becky Naron, Betty Rock Study. Wiley Young is one of my um, uh, co-authors. And uh, oh, here we go. Here's a question from Amy Lauer. I'm not sure who that is. That's of course my partner, my girlfriend. Uh, who's watching downstairs, I guess. So Amy asks, which characters did you create and which did Wiley Young create for the Perfectly Fine House? So that's a good question. So um, she's talking about uh, the Perfectly Fine House, which is our newest release, ironically, from Grindhouse Press. It's as though I have all of these items here uh, to talk about. Uh, so the perfectly fine house is uh, I'll just tell you tell you guys a little bit about it um, I was talking to Brian Keene who actually uh, edited the anthology I just read read from clickers forever he's in charge of JF Gonzalez's literary estate he's a good friend um, and uh, you know if you're watching Brian I hope you're doing well um, we heard from him this weekend so hopefully he's doing well Um, obviously, unfortunately, even though we live rather close, we can't go visit him in light of the social distancing. Um, so I think this might have actually been before Amy and I were dating, who was, you know, asking the question. Um, we went to this uh, shrimp fest. I think it was supposed to be a crab fest, which is apparently a very popular thing in Maryland but they couldn't get crabs it was an unusual situation but uh we ended up having a bunch of shrimp at this event in support of scares that cares which is the charity anthology that i mentioned earlier and uh, as we were driving down there brian says you know a few years ago uh a head full of ghosts came out by paul tremblay which was a very popular uh, exorcism book and he said, you know, the, the exorcism books had their return. He's like, you know, I watch what people read. Uh, you know, I'm, I pay very close attention to this industry. And I think what's going to be next is the haunted house story. And whoever writes the next great haunted house story is going to make a mint. So I'm going to do that unless you beat me to it, Kozniewski, because, you know, maybe you'll do it faster. And I said, well, yeah, of course, I'll do it faster than you, old man. So he pitches me this uh, story, and he says, "You know those tiny houses they have on on H, you know, uh, Home and Garden or whatever the network is called." He's like, "What if you had one of those tiny houses, and it shows up on your lawn, and then it's like the house is haunting you, and then you move to California or something, and you wake up and the tiny house is on your lawn again, and no matter where you go." The tiny house is haunting you. And I was like, well, that's a terrible idea. But I am going to try and do a haunted house story. And the idea I came up with was, uh, and I want to thank the folks at, um, it, it was a Farpoint Science Fiction Convention in, in Baltimore, I think. And I, I pitched them this idea. And I said, what if there was a world where ghosts are very commonplace? Where everybody, you just wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, there's Moaning Myrtle in the toilet. And it's just, you know, whatever. You just deal with ghosts because everyone accepts that they're real. So the only reason you wouldn't see a ghost is if you were functionally blind or dead, like you lacked the sixth sense. You, you, you would be physically lacking in the, in the ghost sense. And uh, I... I pitched this idea I, to the folks at Farpoint, and it was on a panel that was essentially, um, have you hit a, it was like, authors are going to sit on this panel because they've hit a block, and the audience is going to help them. And they did. And they said, okay, well, what happens if there was actually a house that wasn't haunted in this world? And I said, oh, that's a really good idea. And I'm trying to work with this. I'm trying to work with this. I can't come up with anything. Um, Wiley Young flies up from uh, Oklahoma or Texas. I think it was Oklahoma at the time. Anyway, he lives across the country, and he flew up to visit. And we're sitting out on my porch, and I'm telling him this idea. 
And he's immediately, this was around the time of the hurricane that hit um, Puerto Rico. And he's like, okay, so there's a hurricane that wipes out all the ghosts on Puerto Rico or wherever. Um, he's like, the house is actually just a symptom of a greater trouble that's affecting the entire paranormal community. And he's immediately, as we're just we're just sitting on this deck, just discussing ideas, and he's immediately coming up with all these ideas that makes it scary. Because what I said was, there's two ways you can do this. And the bullshit way is you have ghosts and you have jump scares like everyone's always seen before. And it's not scary to the characters because they're used to ghosts, but maybe it's scary to the reader. And I'm like, that's kind of a cop-out. And he said, no, you can make it scary. You make it from the perspective of the ghosts who are terrified that they're going to be disappearing. It's like this existential horror. So we wrote the Perfectly Fine House based on that. And uh, the main characters. So the question was, which characters did you create? And which ones did uh, Wiley create? So Wiley came up with the prologue which was about a little girl who goes walking and uh, her grandmother disappears into the house. So he came up with those two characters. Then the, uh, the main character, Donna Fitzpatrick, I came up with her. Uh, I wrote her chapters. Um, and I think I came up with the idea that she had a twin brother. So the trick is they're twins but the brother died about 15 years ago, so he's a very immature ghost. And uh, I may have come up with the brother, but Wiley wrote Kyle's chapters, so he developed the character almost entirely. That was entirely his. Um, so most of the characters, probably the easiest way to say, most of the characters that were introduced in my chapters I created, and most of the characters that were introduced in... Um, Wiley's chapters he created. So, for instance, um, Kyle's love interest, who's a human, uh, we call them the, uh, what do we call them? Well, we call them ghost fuckers is the, the impolitic term. Uh, so he created her. Um, I created Donna's partner, uh, who's also a ghost, who's essentially retired but is still using the business for money um so yeah i mean it was very very hand in glove we really worked together quite a bit um but uh yeah mo mostly we would create characters as needed and then the other one would use them so that's that's probably more than you wanted to know for that answer all right Melissa Carabayal, hopefully I'm saying that right, says, damn it, I'm late. That's fine, Melissa. We're glad to have you. Feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Wiley Young, who we were just talking about, says, Ghoul Archipelago is in the South Pacific. You know the setting of our Clickers reboot. Want to throw a shout-out or subtle connection in there? Okay. Well, let's see if I have one of those books here I can show you. Here we are. Sorry, I wasn't prepared for a Ghoul Archipelago question, but here is the Ghoul Archipelago. Like the cover was by uh, Chris Enterline, a great little uh, artist who, well, I don't want to promote him too much because I'm not sure if he's doing book covers right now. But uh, seek him out for all of your artistic needs. So um, the Ghoul Archipelago was my take on uh, the zombie, the, the standard zombie apocalypse. I don't want to say standard, but, you know, you're all familiar with The Walking Dead, um, Dawn of the Dead, and so forth. Uh, I wrote Ghoul Archipelago, and I said, you know, let's do something a little bit different with this. Let's at least set it in the South Pacific. And what I liked about that was I could introduce pirates, I could introduce smugglers, I could introduce um, island life, and, uh, you know, the main functional interest of that was in an archipelago, um, 
there's not too many living people and the zombies can't get to you from the cities. So it seemed like an interesting place to set it and also to introduce some of those more. I've had a lot of people say, I can't tell whether this is set in the past or in the future. It's set in the present or maybe a few years in the future. Um, but yes, I got to introduce a lot of those 19th century uh, things that you don't you don't normally see in a contemporary book, pirates and smugglers and the kind of Joseph Conrad um, thing. So our reboot of Clickers. So another reason why um, I was reading from uh, Clickers Forever. So Wiley and I are going to be writing what's tentatively called Clickers Never Die. I'm actually not sure if we announced that, so maybe this is a breaking news for this. Um, and Clickers Never Die is a based on the old Douglas MacArthur quote, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. We thought it would be a great to do a World War II South Pacific um, clicker story. And uh, kind of, we kind of have a, a, a framing story about the modern day, how they discover these old boats that um, were used in World War II. So it kind of forwards the clicker's story in a way, but also takes it back to roots that we may not have known about. Um, so he says, you know the setting of our clicker's reboot. Want to throw a shout out or a subtle connection there? Yeah, so we are working on the clicker's reboot. I have not been working very hard. He has been working very hard. Um, but I need to you know, dig into that and work on that. So, yeah, um, I find the South Pacific to be a really interesting place to write about because it's it's one of those places that we don't have a whole lot of stories about. Even now, as, um, you know, East Asia and even India are starting to be the locations for stories that, you know, they're starting to trickle through. Like, you know, like there was a time when everything was just as, as white bread as you could possibly imagine. You know, every story was set in New York or L.A., and uh, as they're starting to bring in, you know, more diverse audiences and, and more diverse settings, um, I feel like South, the South Pacific is still a place that is not necessarily having its due. So, you know, I enjoy writing about it. Um, I think it's, you know, fascinating area. Um, talking about the, you know, the cargo cults and all sorts of things from uh, World War II and, and from more modern days. Um, I think it's really fascinating. So, yeah, that will be coming out um, shortly, maybe end of the year. We'll see. So, Melissa Carabao says, I can't wait to get my hands on this book. I guess she's talking about Perfectly Fine House. It is out now. Uh, it is available. Um, you can have it shipped from Amazon. Yeah, you can definitely definitely get a hold of the Perfectly Fine House right now. Um, on ebook. Um, so I will say, I mentioned earlier, so let me uh, mention again, and maybe I'll try and put it in the comments if I haven't already. Uh, I am offering a free ebook to everyone who asks for it. So let me see if I can put this in the comments here. Uh, did that work? Did that go through? Okay. There, okay, all right, so I just put in the comments, that is a link to my blog where I'm giving you instructions for how you can get a free ebook. Uh, please reach out to me, I'm happy to do it. I, I would much rather that people are taking ebooks rather than going stir crazy in their homes right now. Uh, so basically what I was saying with that was, um, you know, like the reason that I'm doing this reading and Q&A, um, we want to keep people social distancing. We want to give them something to do while they're in their houses. Uh, I've noticed that there are people, you know, with actual talent, not bullshit, you know, authors like me, um, ballerinas teaching you how to do ballet and fitness instructors teaching you how to exercise and all that sort of thing. So people are, they, they are getting culture out there for free, giving people who are stuck in their houses something to do. So, uh, a lot of my peers have been doing the same thing, and uh, I wanted to, you know, be a part of that. So please reach out to me, ask for a free ebook. 
The only thing I will ask is please do not ask for the perfectly fine house because I want to support Wiley. I want to support Grindhouse. Uh, this was a new release, and I'm not really at the point where I want to be giving that away for free. But my other books, I'm happy to get that out there to give you guys something to do. Um, I'd ask, it, it would be great if you left me a review. If you don't, you know, them's the breaks, whatever. We're all trying to get through this together. So... Uh, Melissa said, okay, okay, Death's Head Press said, yo, dig the book. I guess he's talking about Perfectly Fine House, too. Thank you. Uh, that's our good friends, uh, Jared Barbie and, um, oh, God, they're going to kill me later. Patrick, not Fragwald. Well, anyway, you know, y'all don't want to sit here and watch me try and think of things I can't remember. But Death's Head Press, those, those are uh, good guys. They released... Um, I actually did a blurb for one of their books for um, a riot. It was a Dawn of the Living Impaired and Other Fucked Up Zombie Stories by Christine Morgan, uh, which is a great book. Um, I don't blur books just because people ask me, uh, but that was a great book. I was happy to have my name on that. Um, Christine, she's a great author, great um, reviewer. A uh, great Gargoyles fiction writer, if, fan fiction writer, if you didn't know that. Um, she often gets uh, shit from, uh, well, idiots, let's say, for writing Gargoyles fan fiction. But that was how she got her start. And she wrote an amazing series of uh, zombie short stories, which, believe it or not, I don't know if I told her this, but uh, I read some of those back in the day. Um, there was a role-playing game called All Flesh Must Be Eaten which she wrote a couple of flavor stories for. So if you don't know what a flavored text is, um, if you have a, a game, like a role-playing game, for instance, there's the rules, which is like roll seven dice and you get this result and that result. And then there's the flavor, which is like uh, in rolling that seven dice, you have uh, fired your weapon and the weapon is a Z45 uh, laser pistol and so on and so forth. So she wrote a couple of flavor stories for a role-playing game called All Flesh Must Be Eaten, which I used to play back in the day. So I remembered some of those stories, and I was amazed to see those crop back up again in this book. I remembered them from the time. And, uh, and the new ones, well, new to me, I think they've all been previously published. The new ones were amazing, too. So, uh, again, if you're bored, go and check out uh, Dawn of the Living Impaired by Christine Morgan. Uh, from Death's Head Press. So thanks for thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, Melissa Patrick C. Harrison was the other guy. <laughs> Sorry, it's uh, Jared Barbie and Patrick C. Harrison. Uh, Melissa Carabay Hall. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to say it. Melissa Carabay Hall. Is that it? Okay. Says both. Okay, so she's talking about Perfectly Fine House and Clickers Never Die. Okay, great. We'll get those out to you. Death said, the same for Patrick C. Harrison, Patrick C. Harrison. Okay, Melissa says, got my free book. I'm loving Brain Eater Jones now. Where did you get the idea for this one? For Brain Eater Jones? Okay, uh, Brain Eater Jones was my first published novel, actually. I wrote that in 2009. Um, uh, the story of Brain Eater Jones kind of fell out of me fully formed, which sometimes authors say, which I've always thought sounds kind of like a, um, just like a cop out, but, uh, this is a weird story, but I'll go ahead and tell it. If you've ever watched, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, there's this scene where Indy is on the tank and they're driving down and the Nazi is looking around trying to find him and because Indy's on the tank they can't see him and he jumps up and he goes Volus Jones which is German for where is Jones and uh, it's just such a weird like uh, unnecessarily loud thing to yell so I used to walk around the house um, with that stuck in my head and you know when my ex-wife wasn't home I yell Volus Jones and uh, kind of got stuck in my head. 
And um, I kept thinking about that. And for some reason over the years, it kind of brain morphed into Brady to Jones. Um, and I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what Brain Eater Jones was. And I assume what happened, and this all sounds kind of um, farcical, but I assume what happened was my subconscious brain started working on it and came up with this idea of Brain Eater Jones and said, what is Brain Eater Jones? Who is Brain Eater Jones? Just from that earworm. Um, and one day I was just like, oh, if he has a name, then he's conscious. So he's a conscious zombie. And almost immediately I was like, well, if you have a conscious zombie, why do you call him Brain Eater Jones? Be like, oh, it's like a slur. It's like uh, every time you see an Irish guy, you call him Mick or something. And I was like, okay, well, we don't really do that anymore. I mean, maybe shitty people do, but we don't really do that anymore. So oh, well, it will be set in the past. It's set in the 30s or something when it will be okay to just call a guy by an ethnic slur. And then, then I was like, oh, well, if it's set in the 30s, it has to be set during Prohibition, and it has to be like a, you know, a um, noir detective novel. And then I was like, well, why does Prohibition affect zombies? Well, oh, of course, because they have to drink. If they don't drink, then their brains don't work. And the whole story just kind of came tumbling out. So I assume what happened is for years and years and years, my subconscious brain was working on all these little ins and outs, and I eventually came up with that. So... That's where Brain Eater Jones came from. Uh, then Death's Head Press says, Christine is the Martha Stewart of the genre. Great author and lady. Thanks for the shout out, Jared. Yes. Um, I don't know if I'd call her the Martha Stewart of the genre. That's certainly a way to put it. Uh, she is uh, a ravenous reader, great writer. Um, I even read some of her... Uh, fantasy stuff i'm actually kind of a fan of fantasy i'm not nearly as well read in it as i am in horror but uh some of her old um uh you know high fantasy stuff written nearly 20 years ago and you pick it up now and you're like oh wow this is still really good and in the 20 intervening years she has done nothing but develop as an author so it's just been you know it's it's amazing you're really talking about somebody at the at the peak of her um, skills. So uh, Tommy Clark joined. Hi, Tommy. Gary B. Phillips joined. Hi, Gary. Um, we're getting to the end here, so uh, we've still got three or four minutes, and I'm I'm happy to go longer if anybody has any questions. Um, but if not, uh, I will say. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, we still got two minutes or so for you to get it in, and, and I'm happy to keep going. Uh, so as a reminder, um, Clickers Forever is the book that I read from today, and that's featuring um, Jonathan Jans, Jay Wilburn, uh, Brian Keene, um, Gabino Iglesias, Ralph James White, all Nick Mamatas, all the classics of, uh, of the splatterpunk genre and horror in general. So I think you guys would really dig this book. It is available now, and uh, all of the proceeds go to Jeff Gonzalez's estate, to, to his uh, wife and daughter and family. So uh, make sure to pick up a copy of that. Uh, we also talked about The Perfectly Fine House. That's another one I'll say please pick up a copy because as I said, it, it just came out and uh, I'd really appreciate if we could um, support Wiley Young, support Grindhouse. It's great if you support me, but you know, whatever. I got a full-time job. I can, I can survive. I'm okay. I'll be good. But uh, please do support my uh, publisher, my co-author on that. Make sure to pick up copies of those. Uh, we also talked about the Ghoul Archipelago, which great if you pick up a copy. If not, check out that link I put in the comments. I will be happy to send anybody a copy of that or any of my other books. Please just not Perfectly Fine House because that just came out and we're trying to push it. Okay, I think we did get maybe one or more, one or two more questions. Okay. Death's Head Press, tell me about your short Deep Into That Dark One peering and Clickers Forever. 
Damn, I missed the reading. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm not going to say this is going to be the last questions, but get your questions in now because as it's looking in the comments, is that another one? Okay. Uh, Melissa says I'll be more prepared next time. Okay. Um, oh, and, I, and that does, I do have a question I want to ask you guys. Would you be interested in seeing more of these, not necessarily from me, but from uh, my other peers? I, I was talking to uh, K-Trap Jones, who runs the Splatter Club. Would you guys like this to be kind of a series? So if maybe I could get, you know, I mentioned uh, Jay Wilburn or maybe some of the Death's Head Press people. We talked about Christine and uh, Wiley Young. Would you guys be interested in seeing more of these? Should I send people to trap, or is this boring and stupid and you're not really interested? Um, but I'll talk to some people and see if we can turn this into a series if, if you guys are interested. Um, so uh, Jared at Death's Head says, tell me about your short, deep into the dark one period. Right, so um, I did talk about this a little bit earlier. Um, basically, I read all the Clickers books. Um, I particularly love Clickers versus Zombies because that was just kind of the wacky uh, parallel universe one um, that kind of kind of took things in a different direction. But you know, I love them all. And uh, when Brian King was talking about doing an anthology to benefit JF Gonzalez's um, family, benefit his estate, um, he said he was interested in short stories and essays and that sort of thing. I only met J.F. Gonzalez once, which I regret. Um, it's it's actually, I mean, what the hell, we're, we're doing an AMA. I, I greatly regret it. Um, I regret that I hadn't talked to him more. I, I regret I hadn't gotten the chance to know him. I sometimes think back to that day and I feel bad because I, I just, I wasn't, um, I didn't take that opportunity. It was like a missed opportunity. I met the man once briefly. He was overwhelmingly kind to me, uh, gave me a bunch of advice on being a writer, and that was it. Um, I never saw him again. He died. He passed away. And uh, to this day, I really regret that because I feel like, you know, you, you meet somebody and maybe you, you fuck it up off the bat, but then, you you know, you get to see them again. You're like, oh, okay, he really does like me. Oh, all right, okay. Um we didn't, we didn't get to talk last time, but this time we did get to talk. And it was one of those where I felt like, I don't think he got a good impression of me, but I wish he had known, you know, how much I respected him and that kind of thing. So when Brian was talking about um, putting together Clickers Forever, I didn't feel like I could write an essay about J.F. Gonzalez. Um, all I could say was, hey, I fucked up that first meeting. You know, what, what else could I say? I didn't have any personal experience with him. But... I did think, and I thought at that time, that um, nobody was going to be writing about Dark Ones. They were going to be writing about the Clickers and maybe Survivor, maybe Primitive. Um, but I didn't think people were going to be focusing on the Dark Ones. So I thought that was maybe something I could do to make my story stand out. Because um, I knew it was going to, I assumed it was going to be like, oh, a Clicker story, oh, a Clicker story, oh, a Clicker story. Okay, I'm bored with people getting their faces melted. So I thought I would write a Dark One story, and as I often do, I sympathize with the monster, and I like to write things from first perspective, uh, first person perspective, as you can tell from uh, Melissa asked earlier about Brain Eater Jones, the hematophages. Um, I find it very easily to get into the mind of a monster, and I thought nobody else would be doing that. I thought those two things, I was pretty confident there would not be many other Dark One stories and there would not be many first person stories. And so I thought that alone would make it stand out. And so I submitted it and I think, um, I, I kind of, I won't say I fired and forgot, but I sent it out and I, and I didn't think about it because what else are you gonna do with that story? Like I, you can't place it anywhere else. You can't use somebody else's intellectual property. Um, so I was like, well, I hope he takes it. And then the next time I talked to Brian, I was like, oh, hey, what's going on with that thing? And he's like, oh, yours was head and shoulders above most of the ones I've got. And he's like, don't don't worry, you're, you're, you're going to get in there. So I was like, oh, all right. So I, I guess maybe I did do good by J.F. Gonzalez. Maybe I did, um, you know, honor his memory a little bit. So I felt really good about that. Uh, let's see. 
Melissa says, uh, I'll come more prepared with questions next time. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thanks for the live chat. Stay healthy. Yeah, you too. Everybody stay healthy out there. Death's Head says, keep up the good work, brother. You too. You guys are doing a good job out there. Um, in case you guys don't know, um, uh, the next Wiley Young book, I think, is already out. It's called Magpies and Coffins or, or the Magpie Coffin or something like that. It's a Western, a straight Western, um, which is definitely my jam. Um, I'm, you know, one of the first things I did was I made my girlfriend watch uh, Unforgiven um, when we started dating. Uh, so I definitely uh, love Westerns. I know you guys are coming out with a line of Westerns, I believe, coming from Death's Head. Uh, okay. Melissa says, absolutely just saw Jan's yesterday. I'm loving it. He, he did a live. Okay. I'll see if I can get Jan's to do one for the um, Splatter Cup. Splatter Club 2. Death's Head says, absolutely more of this. Okay. So... We'll definitely try and see if we can get uh, more folks to do this with Splatter Club. So, Trap, uh, K Trap Jones, I'm going to start sending people your way. Uh, Death's, Pred, Death's Head Press says it was a damn fine reading. Hope to see you at KillerCon. Thanks. We'll see. I, I don't know at this point. I was planning to go to KillerCon, but I'm not going to travel if we're still not traveling. Obviously, it's not an emergency. Uh, the Magpie Coffin, Wiley Young says, the Magpie Coffin Splatter Western. But it's straight, right? It's not, I mean, it's not, there's no supernatural elements, right? It's like a, like a, it's like horror Western, but no, um, like there's no ghosts or anything, right? I don't know if they're, uh, Splatter Western Book One, Splatter Western Book One. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sure they'll they'll comment and let you guys know about that. Or are they already? Okay. All right. Well, I think that's it, folks. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. And uh, if you didn't catch it the first time, thanks for going back and, and watching this. Hope you enjoyed the reading. Hope you enjoyed the AMA. Um, if you can spell it right, you can find me online. I hope you will take me up on that free book offer. If not... Um, you know, grab my books, you know, grab books from some of the people we've talked about, Magpie Coffin from Wiley Young, uh, Dawn of the Living Impaired from Christine Morgan, um, Clickers Forever, a tribute to JF Gonzalez, uh, edited by uh, Brian Keene. Um, so I think that's it for today, and I will talk to some of my peers and see if we can get some more stuff for the Splatter Club coming up. So thanks for coming out, everybody, and we will see you next time.